you said something there actually that, that um, I was going to ask about. You said that the visual system is in this region here. Mm. And actually in your book, there's quite a lot of detail about the brain structure, brain size, yeah. um, but also the morphology, the layout of the brain. How do we know that? I found it quite remarkable that we could speak with some confidence about that. It's basically because um, the inside of your skull, the, there's like, you know, the brain essentially leaves the imprint of itself on there your skull grows around it and you can make a cast of that i mean people used to make just like plaster cast or whatever but now we can basically do like you scan the skull and then you digitally just fill it in and suddenly you've got this brain on the screen you can even see like where the arteries were across the surface of the brain so it's just like this living thing so you can um immediately assess what the structural differences the surface differences are um, and you can sort of estimate how well different areas appear to be connected and um, the relative differences in size so like yes the visual system at the back um looks to be larger um but i think the 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 nasal area the olfactory bulb which is what allows us you know to detect smells and things um that was a bit smaller um but in us, we have this like very big forehead compared to Neanderthals, and there's sort of goes back. And ours is filled with um, with an area that is I mean, it's very complicated, but it's involved a lot of different things to do with um, speech and planning and complex mental sort of um, processes. But the problem is, is that we don't know sort of how all those functioned in life. Uh, what we do know about our brains is that say if somebody is injured um, or even if they just spend a lifetime doing a particular skill the brain is quite plastic and it can shift and change and adapt so <clears throat> although there is a large visual area at the back it's been suggested that maybe that meant there was less room in the brain overall for complex processes of thought but we don't know if that is a real trade-off um, because we can't actually, you know, we don't have an MRI scan of a Neanderthal thinking, so we can't actually see how it was working. It's, it's based sort of on, on appearances, really. But um, it does appear from some experiments that have been done where um, this is all very new stuff where people are sort of trying to grow Neanderthal brain cells, essentially. Um, they do appear to be structurally different. But again, how that translates into actual lived behaviour is, is, you know, impossible to tell, except we have the archaeology. Um, and that's what tells us what they actually did and what they were really capable of. So that's the good balance for the anatomy. I, I can't let that pass, by the way, by you said people are growing Neanderthal brain cells. <laughs> you very, very briefly comment on that that's from dna presumably um, yeah there is um there's active work that's being done by some labs basically they are putting um um neanderthalized um sort of uh genetic material into um sort of animal brain cells and, and just only growing like tiny amounts um and just seeing if there is at a very basic stage if those cells develop differently um so i mean that's that's an area that you know people are interested in um, but you do you do run into sort of tricky ethical questions quite soon with that in terms of you know how big do you do you let these clumps of brain cells grow and yeah so that's that's an area that i think uh, yeah the the field of human origins is is, is needing to have a discussion about yeah. just on that actually i was going to go to questions later let's just say to everyone you can you can type in the q a window but um lydia ebden has just related to that has asked a question about she says that Dunbar's ratio of the neocortex size to the brain apparently suggests that Neanderthals were cognitively adapted for group sizes of around 120. Um, yeah. First of all is that and, and but then, then she asked if that's right how can we predict that if we don't have an actual brain but I think you answered that a bit but yeah that's to do with like the the general structure of the brain related to the size of the body and everything like that and if you compare it across primates um then yeah on that measure Neanderthals come out as pretty much the same as us you would expect them to 
um, to be able to sort of, if that is a, a direct correlation, which it generally appears to be, um, that they would be having complex social relations, because that's really what that measure means. It's like the complexity of social relations that you are able to, to process and keep track of in your, in your mind. Um, and the implication is that Neanderthals had similar social networks. Um, but really, you know, we've, we've got to remember that the contemporary early Homo sapiens groups who were at the round at the same time before 40,000, they don't appear um, on, in archaeological terms to have lived in bigger groups or sort of had massive social networks before 40,000. It's not clear. The only difference is that um, we have very few uh, genomes or genetic samples from people in Europe older than 40,000, so from Homo sapiens people. Um, but the ones that we do have show no evidence for any sort of inbreeding or even, you know, very small population sizes, which you can tell um, from the genetics. Whereas in contrast, the Neanderthals do seem to have a signature for that. In some cases, it does look like there is very close inbreeding you know like cousins or like a, a grandparent and a child but that's not all neanderthal groups um others it looks like they had slightly bigger breeding populations um but there's no sign of of this sort of restricted population um effect in early homo sapiens people which does point to some difference in how connected their groups were so they probably had and lived every day in very tiny groups be they hunter gatherers they're moving around an awful lot the environment's the same um but it's pointing to a connectedness between different groups that the diversity of their genetics is more than neanderthals so there does seem to be something different there but that might not be to do with cognitive capacity it might just be to do with um, sort of the the differences in in um, how Neanderthals were hunting, perhaps, or, or the extent to which they um, they used material culture um, to form bonds with different groups. So it's it's complicated, but there does seem to be a difference. And in terms of, I have another question actually from Michael Hunter, which is related to, to the technology um, mm. and I suppose the wider culture of how ideas were passed on, which is which is a simple question, could Neanderthals throw and hence attack from a distance? Um, uh, yeah, it used to be thought based on the anatomy that they probably weren't very good at that, but um, the archeology span sort of throws a, throws, a, throws a question up literally in the form of a spear um, in that there is a site um, from Germany, which is quite early, it's 330,000 years. This is early, well, we believe it's early Neanderthals. Um, and there are multiple beautifully crafted wooden spears from this site and they're long and they appear to be weighted in a similar way that javelins are, as in they are intended to be thrown. Um, <clears throat> so that's one, one place where that seems to be the case. Um, on the other hand, in, in a later site um, dated around 120,000 years ago, again in Germany, um, but by this point the environment's totally different, it's a woodland world, and here we don't have the spear, um, but we have um, two fallow deer stags um, which have been hunted and we can see it because there's massive holes in the bones and there's like really cool experiments that have been done which basically prove that that is a spear injury um, but they do not appear to have been thrown um, they appear to have been um, spears that were thrust sort of up and, and from below into um, the bodies of these animals but um, that doesn't mean sort of that Neanderthals never threw. What it does suggest is that Neanderthals varied how they hunted depending on the kind of environment they were living in. Because if you're in a massive deciduous forest like the forest we have today in Europe, um, you know, full of big oak and beech trees, um, trying to throw a javelin in that kind of environment is not going to do you very well. Um, whereas if you're um, in a more open environment, which is uh, like the one at the earlier site with these more javelin-like spears, um, then it makes a lot more sense that you would have a technology that allows you to, to throw and um, to stay away from really dangerous animals if you can uh, at all avoid it. Um, and it is interesting that there is, in the, in the later forested context, um, there is another site 
where we have a spear that seems to be associated with an elephant skeleton. Um, this spear is long, but it's thick. So it might be showing that there is a different kind of spear um, where you're still stabbing. It's like a giant pike, really. Um, but you want to keep away from the animal. So it's like a finishing off spear or something. So there's, a, there's potential that Neanderthals had multiple different kinds of, um, of spears, depending on the environment and depending on the kind of hunting and potentially even the kind of animals that they were trying to take. That's, that's entirely possible. Hmm. And, and that's the, the uh, I suppose, understanding or speculating on, understanding is a better word, isn't it? They're, they're, they're hunting. I can see how you can do that. You can see how they hunt by the artifacts that you find. But th there are broader um, questions that are, sort of, I suppose, deeper questions in the way you, you approach in the book. Uh, burial rituals, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I suppose the existence, I used the word before, but of a, of a culture in a sense that how they thought about the world. And so that's my question. Um, what do we know about how they would have thought about the world? Well, it's always tricky. I mean, whatever period in archaeology you're dealing with, you know, we don't have written texts. We don't have people's voices. Um, I mean, the question of how reliable historical texts are is another thing, but we don't have that. So all we can base it on is, um, is looking at their bodies to see how they lived, um, and looking at the stuff that they made and what they did. And with Neanderthals, I think um, we've always suffered from a problem of wanting to make them a foil to us. You know, we, we've wanted them to be other to us for a long time. So there's always been a desire or a sort of even subconscious sort of um, trend to, to wish to position them differently. Um, and to see difference in whatever there is. But I think that has changed a lot um, in the past sort of three decades or so as archaeological methods have, have developed um, and we've basically got better at looking. We have started to see much more um, sort of similarity than, than used to be the case. And I think one of the, the interesting areas with that is you can look at you can look at hunting for you know i mean people we tend to think oh hunting it's just assistance it's just food and that but it gives you a window into sort of the complexity of how they viewed the world in material form and um, what we can see in how in in how they hunted is that they basically took the best of what was around them and um, they could handle big beasts but they took small beasts too um, but what you see everywhere is that they're completely focused on the quality of the of the animals and the food that they're taking and um, so they will choose um you know the the best animals from from the herd and um, they will butcher um the fattest ones they will focus on the the most marrow rich parts of the skeleton as they butcher and then they'll take away the best bits um and then when they use the the bones for for tool making as well they're focused on the different parts of the body they're very selective and so this understanding of, of materials and an interest in quality, you can then take that much more sophisticated understanding of how they, they hunted and apply it to other things that they were doing as well. Um, <clears throat> you see the same thing in stone tools. All the stone tool technology points to a really similar sort of sophisticated level of, of, of ability to make tools and also to understand rock. And when you start to think about how they thought about the world, then you can begin to sort of say, OK, if we are looking for something that we might want to think about as symbolic or aesthetic, can we see a similar interest in materials um, that have nothing to do, as far as we can tell, with any functional purpose? And the answer is yes, there are. Um, you can look, for example, at evidence for pigment use is a good one. Mm. Um, so that's just natural minerals basically like people might know it as, as ochre and things like this you know that, that give colour and although there are a number of different potential uses for those materials that, that are functional like you can you can use um, <clears throat> you can use ochre to to make like a sunblock basically if you sort of mix it with fat you can use it to treat animal hides um, as, as part of sort of the waterproofing and the softening process and we know that they were really into their hide making um, but once you sort of are able to rule those activities out it leaves you with the question of well, why do you want 
colourful substances. Um, and what we do seem to be seeing by sort of amalgamating decades of, of really careful work where people are very conservative in their interpretations, you put it all together. And it does seem that in some times and places, Neanderthals were interested in um, in reds and oranges, in pigments, um, and also black colours. Um, with the black ones, it's kind of interesting because um, some of those are manganese, which you do sometimes find naturally in caves. It's just a mineral that occurs. Um, and some work was done looking at the fact that it seems to potentially be something like a fire lighter, like a chemical accelerant to get your fire started. Um, so that's a possible use in some places. But in other places, they are using um, different kinds of black pigment that don't do that and that have no real sort of functional purpose. But across all the different sites where we find pigment, if you look um, at sort of the traces on these little lumps and, and nodules, you can see that in some they're scraping to get powder off, but in others it's sort of been rubbed on soft substances. And we don't know what that is. It might be, might be to do with animal hide working or it might be on skin, their own skin. We don't really know. So the pigments by themselves are intriguing, but unclear. But what you really need is like, you know, a, one object that combines lots of strangeness together where you can say, okay, here is something that is a, an aesthetic sense. And we do have some examples of that. Um, one of the ones that I do like to talk about, and I, I talk about it in the book as a, as a really great sort of point um, in, in space that gives us this, this combination is a tiny little shell from an Italian site uh, called uh, Grotto Formane and that's about 55,000 years old so it's quite late for Neanderthals um, but it's interesting because it's a fossil shell so it's nothing to do with food collection there are other sites where they're collecting shells but it's to do with food um, but at this site it's a fossil it was probably collected about 100 kilometers away from that cave where it's been found um, so a Neanderthal had to come had to encounter a geological deposit and be presumably curious about what these shells are and take one. Um, but even more than that, there was really amazing analysis done and it was shown that on the outside of this little fossil shell, there is red pigment, not inside it, just on the outside. And it appears to have sort of like a polished um, sort of luster in some areas to it as if it's been held onto or something like this. So, this object has come from a long way away. It's got pigment on it, which is unusual. The pigment itself is from about 40 kilometers away. So it brings together sort of all these unusual behaviors that seem to have no clear functional purpose. And I mean, Neanderthals were totally mobile. You know, they had to carry everything with them all the time. So even though it's tiny, somebody made a decision to, to carry that around with them and presumably lost it. But if that was found, in an early Homo sapiens site, there would be no question that it was interpreted as something socially meaningful, something with an aesthetic interest. Perhaps it was made to be seen or not, but it's there. And that object and others like that allow you to kind of look out at the other sites where you see sort of evidence for pigments on shells that are to do with food, for example, but there's also pigment on them. And you start to see it all in a different light. So it's that sort of ability to, um, to move between different realms of the of the material, the archaeological evidence that we have to build up an argument that where we can say yes, there is some kind of interesting aesthetic sense that Neanderthals had and, and how they viewed the world um, in a way that's not very different to what we see in contemporary early Homo sapiens.